Thank you all for coming this afternoon to uh, hear a talk from uh, Bruce Jingles from Cook Medical. I uh, met Bruce, uh, well, I saw Bruce speak at the Association for University Technology Managers uh, several months ago uh, this year. And when he was talking, I uh, was very impressed with what he had to say, his, his viewpoint on uh, technology commercialization, uh, intellectual property management and thought, you know, if I could get this guy to come to WVU to give a talk, I, it'd be a real coup. Uh, about a month after I got back into town, um, uh, Clay Marsh sent an email and said, hey, I have a friend of mine's coming to campus and I'd like for you to meet with him. His name's Bruce Jingles. And so it was really serendipitous on, on that whole thing. Um, and so Bruce and I have been in communication for the past several months and uh, we've managed to find a little bit of time for him to come and join us here in, in, the, in the middle of summer. So I'm, I'm thrilled to see this many people show up with, with uh, vacations and everything that's been going on. Um, Bruce uh, graduated uh, in 1977 from Indiana University with a BA in uh, biology. And he was hired by Cook Incorporated in 1979 to be the company's first sales representative for its, first, for its newly formed uh, critical care division. In, 80, in 91, he uh, moved from California to Cook's Bloomington, Indiana headquarters as director of sales and product development and in 1999 was uh, named Vice President Cook Critical Care and Global Strategic Business Unit Leader. In uh, 2011, he moved to the newly created position of Vice President Global Technology Assessment and Healthcare Policy. And in this job, he works with Cook's 10 business units to strengthen their medical technology pipeline, uh, develop economic analysis for Cook products, and to foster pragmatic relationships between industry, academia, and health systems. Bruce serves on the CTSI External Advisory Committees for Indiana University, UCSF, Ohio State University, University of Chicago, and the University of Florida, and has been invited to speak about medical device invention and commercialization at more than 35 uh, CME, CLE forums in Europe, Asia, Australia, and North America. He also has five issued patents. Um, Bruce uh, has uh, a, a great uh, talk planned for you this morning, afternoon. Uh, I hope you have some, uh, some questions for him after he's done, and uh, I feel very fortunate that he's here to, to join us and, and share his insights. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Richard, for that very warm welcome. And I want to say what an honor it is to be here with you today. Uh, I've been with my employer for 36 years. I hope today to provoke some thinking, but not to offend. And if any of my comments uh, create a poor reaction, I apologize in advance. Uh, but I do hope to move um, some of these themes beyond what is uh, commonly uh, talked about. So without uh, delay, uh, we all know what the issue is here, and I only represent the medical device industry. I know virtually nothing about pharmaceuticals or diagnostics. Uh, my, my perspective is born solely out of uh, work with devices. But we know today that many, many patients today don't have access to cures, to, uh, to the treatments that get them past pain and, um, and illness. So I'd like to begin by defining, helping you um, distinguish inventions from innovations, because these terms are often used interchangeably, but in fact they're quite different. So the invention is something that can sit on your desk. It's something that you've created. An innovation has to sit on someone else's desk, not your own, usually through a transaction, a purchase. So the innovation is the adoption of an invention, the diffusion into popular use. So in the academic environment, when problem solvers, often clinicians, sometimes engineers, conceive of a better mousetrap, this immediately begins a chain of decision-making and activity that puts the status quo at risk. People with embedded incentive to perform in a way that they've been thoroughly trained, uh, rewarded, to propose that those practices be altered, and sometimes very radically, can be an extremely uncomfortable experience. You're now moving someone's cheese. 
So what I would suggest is that if you choose to follow the path of innovation, engage in this activity, prepare for disagreement, for conflict, for battle. Uh, it's worth it, but it's not easy. This paper in uh, Genetics and Medicine in 2007, one year after the first awards for the Clinical Translational Science uh, Awards from the NIH by Khoury and colleagues, describes what at that time was the academic approach to translational research. And what we're really talking about today is this framework of translational research. The CTSAs were a shotgun marriage ordained by the NIH to fortify a part of their research portfolio that was not being adequately addressed through most of their basic science protocols. Now, what I'd like to call your attention to in this outline by Khoury in trying to define translational research are several synonyms. We see here uh, trials, studies, more trials, more studies, guidelines, research, 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 trials, and research. These are all synonyms for research. We don't see a single reference here to the translation. This is all R, no T, and by definition, it has to be false. A more truthful definition, at least uh, in my own mind, is this one. And I think what we're seeing today in this uh, national urgency to do more for patients, more for society, is converting knowledge into some benefit. Benefit beyond a single PI's laboratory. You're all familiar with Moore's Law, uh, Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel Corporation, before that the uh, Fairchild Semiconductor Corporation, who in 1965 in an obscure electronics magazine proposed this idea of every 18 months transistor capability would double. And this is a great example of Moore's Law in action. Here's this old IBM computer. It weighs 4,000 pounds, has 20 gigs. Fast forward 30 years, you get 32 gigs with half a gram. And that has characterized the uh, microprocessor and semiconductor industries. Moore's Law is still in effect, still in force in 2015. In a paper in Nature Reviews in 2012, a group of researchers looking at the low rate of drug development success talked about drug research as E. Room's law, Moore's law in reverse. In fact, we're going backwards. It's going slower and slower. This slide reflects uh, these are medical device approvals, pre-market approvals from the FDA. And we see in 10-year incremental periods declines of 30 and 40 percent. This is a summary slide of the Nature Reviews article, one of the most highly cited uh, articles ever published in Nature showing the cost per approval in pharmaceuticals over this period of time. Uh, and, it, and if this trend continues, the United States in only a few years will no longer be developing any small molecules. So one of the uncomfortable realities of translational research, discovery, and benefit to society is the idea of how does this eventually get applied to the patient. And in fact, and if you look at the highlighted portion in red, this is sort of a summary of the process by which discoveries become real to people outside of the laboratory. So. Why do this stuff? 
I mean, what's the big deal about translation research? And particularly, if you're a place at Harvard uh, or Hopkins with uh, uh, hundreds of millions in NIH funding, why change? And what I would suggest today, there are several reasons that translation research has broad benefit and is very much worth engaging in. And I think this one, number two, this, this ability to impact humans far beyond one's own practice could ever hope to achieve. A, a busy pediatrician today may see 60 patients in a day. 60 patients, that's a lot. The average time it's reported for a pediatrician and their patients today runs between six and a half and seven minutes per episode. But even at that high rate of turnover, the number of patients that that provider can impact in the course of a year is a fraction of the number of patients that an inventor can impact by discovering and developing a better mousetrap. You can think of things like the Foley catheter, the Swan-Gans catheter, the, the pulse oximeter, and all of these have had phenomenal global impact beyond one's uh, own reach. Well, if it's so great, why isn't there more of it? Uh, we know patients benefit from having access to better technology. Why don't we see more people engaged in the enterprise? And my view is that it's usually one of these three things or some combination. And generally, I think it's the last. So if an innovators are going to work with the commercial side, either uh, established manufacturers, uh, with venture capitalists, equity partners. What does that partner need from the inventor in order to make this partnership successful? And generally, these are the areas we need to know what, what problem are you solving and, and what's the best way to solve it. In order for us to fill out our applications to the FDA and for CE Mark in Europe and around the world, uh, some some information. And in the end, what we really hope for is that the employer of the inventor will adopt this technology to the benefit of their own system. This idea of, in fact, we have a litmus test in our country. We'll ask an inventor who says, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. You have to develop this product with me. It's, it's phenomenal. So we'll ask, if we invest the time and energy, the hard work to bring this to the market, the average three, four, or five years, once it's on the market, is this something that you would use on your own patients? And oftentimes today what we hear is, well, my hospital's a little bit stingy about this stuff, but everybody else will use this. And this quickly is a signal to us uh, about the appropriate future action. Now let's turn it around. What should the inventor then expect from their industry partner if they're going to work together on a new idea? And I think these uh, represent not all, this is not uh, exhaustive, but many of the uh, expectations. And the last I think today is uh, not only uh, increasingly um, important, but really has become an expectation. How do these royalties work? Now we're talking about money. Uh, a U.S. patent is 20 years. We never get that amount, but that's the defined period by the USPTO. Uh, you don't have to have a patent to get royalties. And there's a range in the rates. If multiple people combine on one invention, then each may get a little bit less individually, but the manufacturer may pay more overall. So how does this cycle go? So we have an idea, the company's interested, the inventor wants to work with the company, and this is typically the pathway by which these uh, partnerships form. Now, this second point here is intended to demystify a common misunderstanding about why companies invest in academic technology. The idea that it's for the company to make money is really not the truth. The money is the reward. It's not the purpose. If you, when companies, generally speaking, I'm talking about generally speaking, when they 
agree to form a partnership. The idea is what can we do together to do something that's really good? And if it is good, then we'll share the rewards. And if it doesn't work out, so be it. We'll go on to the next thing. Return on investment is usually down the list at four, five, or six on the priority scale. And, and many people find that surprising. Uh, let's see, so today we pay a fee to the FDA, a user fee, under the Medical Device User Fee and Modernization Act of 2002. So we pay the FDA, as does the pharmaceutical industry, to review the documents that we submit for safety and efficacy. For us to fill out the paperwork, not to conduct any clinical trials, not to do any experiments, no lab work, just to download those documents for the 510K, that's the short form, uh, substantial equivalence to a predicate, we pay 4,000 bucks for the paperwork. If we want to do a clinical trial to download the documents that will allow us to eventually do the trial, those documents cost us almost $300,000. And the cycle time today for, for, uh, for the 510K, the short form products, it takes us uh, roughly three years, and on PMAs about five years. There's a lot of interest today about whether it's appropriate for manufacturers and academicians to be working together on products that will eventually yield not only a better outcome for patients, but in the process may generate profit. And that profit may be shared in any number of ways. And so does the primary and fiduciary responsibility of a provider go off track if they're incentivized by a commercial enterprise? I think the um, the comment I'll make about this is that uh, it's hard to avoid conflicts today. If you're paid in a fee-for-service model or in a salaried model, you're conflicted. Both of those carry significant conflict. Uh, I think that the discussion should perhaps focus more on misconduct, on poor behavior, than on the potential uh, that's expressed through this idea of, well, you do have two interests. And I think that in the universities, you find so many smart people that most are capable of managing multiple interests simultaneously. Now, the problem with conflicts of interest is you potentially can have an error, a harm. Someone was paid, and does that influence their judgment, their decision making in such a way that it harms somebody else for their own benefit? That's called type one error. So this is a risk, and there's two expressions of these errors. There's type one, and there's type two. That is that if someone were paid to develop a drug or device that was harmful, but they made so much money, they say, I'm going to go ahead and put it out there. The money, I can't resist it. The money is so big, even though this thing is unsafe. I'm going to promote this in the market. And this would be a type one error, or an error of commission. But if the system becomes so afraid of the damages that may occur from these incentives that the policies become so restrictive that there's cessation of activity, we no longer do research and development, we no longer do commercialization, we stop on our tracks because of the fear of criticism, because of the fear of the potential for a type one error, now you have a type two error. You have an error of omission. The university fails to do what the university said it was going to do from the beginning. We simply let it stop. And now you have uh, patients suffering deprivation. And you decide, where in the balance do you want to live? So. I hear a lot of calls today in medical schools, you know, we need to really be much more professional about this. We have to be very careful about these relationships. And engaging in these activities is highly unprofessional. That has been proposed and, and uh, there are citations. And we're very concerned about relationships with commercial interests because they tend to present a bias. They're mostly excited about their own products and services with very little attention to those of others. This is the verbatim page of the Random House, reads about 
uh, almost identical to Webster uh, on these definitions of profession, professional, and professionalism. Altruism is not listed. There is no mention of the word. Exemplary conduct or any other form of conduct is not listed in any of the definitions. So we have to decide according to the literal definition of professionalism, whether we want to be professional according to the dictionary's approach or whether we need a different word for a syndrome, a form of behavior that has maybe accidentally captured under that terminology. But when I read this, and you can, uh, and I would welcome disagreement about it, I don't see anything here that discourages the type of activity that we're talking about, that I'm talking about today. So this first line, these are all technologies for which I have a strong bias. It's an evidence-based bias, but I'm strongly biased in favor of disc brakes, airbags. I, I grew up in Ann Arbor near Detroit. We were influenced by auto technology in the old days. I wear sunglasses. But in the late 80s, when angioplasty was being popularized on the uh, groundbreaking work of Andreas Grunzig. At the American Heart Association, they presented thousands of successful cases treated with coronary angioplasty, dozens of clinical references showing the success of, uh, of minimally invasive therapy for coronary revascularization. Six months later, at the American Association of Thoracic Surgeons, the Cleveland Clinic presented an enormous volume of patients, 10 authors, of a five-year trial on the primary therapeutic intervention for uh, uh, ischemic coronary disease, touting coronary artery bypass grafting with internal mammary takedown. Also highly evidence-based, dozens and dozens of references. Both of these approaches were well-referenced, and yet both were quite different in the recommendation and really served the credentialing of the provider. The cardiologist was not going to perform bypass and the surgeon was disincentivized to do angioplasty. If you present today with chronic lower back pain in any tertiary care hospital and you happen to see either an anesthesiologist, uh, an orthopedic surgeon, a neurologist, the probability is that the recommendations for treatment of your back pain are going to be significantly different according to those three. I would suggest that this represents a form of bias. So we like research because it de-risks, it gives us a certainty about an outcome. We can predict what's going to happen and that's efficient, it's economical, uh, and it can enhance safety. However, if you wait until there's infinite certainty through research, your efforts become ossified. And again, finding this balance in this tension is a significant challenge. Uh, I won't dwell on this. So there's a lot of discussion today about, well, who really brings the cake to the party? Who's really primarily responsible for the significant health gains? Uh, I think since 1910, for Americans, our life expectancy has increased by 60%. In the last 20 years, our life expectancy in the U.S., uh, according to one reference, has gone up by 10 years. I'm sorry, in the last 40 years, it's gone up by 10 years. So who's really responsible for these phenomenal advances in the quality and quantity of life? Some people will say it's the basic research funded by the NIH that led, allowed industry to later just carry the ball over the goal line. Others say if you look at the track record, industry, at least on the small molecule side, has done much more work than, um, than NIH-funded uh, research in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. But the truth is it doesn't matter. These points are moot because the, neither side can do this alone. I can tell you, our company, we are not going to be enrolling patients in clinical trials. And the university is not going to jeopardize its tax, its nonprofit tax status to hire a sales force. So whether it's 1% against 99% or 50 and 50, 
these partnerships, I would argue, are ordained. So uh, there's, a, there's sort of a, uh, a process here. These things begin with an invention. Someone comes up with a really cool solution to a problem. Once you have that, then the market needs to know how to use it, on whom, under what circumstances, with what level of training, uh, with, uh, in which patients. Once you have your CME part completed, then the company can take it out and sell it. And eventually, this reaches patients and uh, results in an innovation. So how does each participant in these areas benefit from their contribution to the larger equation? So the researcher or the inventor, they may be getting funding from the NIH or the NSF. They may have uh, grants, they may go to foundations. But their work is uh, funded by well-known mechanisms. The medical school and professional medical societies benefit because they can charge tuition or uh, dues, have fees. Uh, these could be uh, tuition, uh, I'm sorry, um, any number of fees that you're already familiar with. Once it reaches the manufacturer or a provider or the insurance industry, they, uh, re they uh, refer to their contribution either through sales or a reimbursement calculation. They may earn royalties. And then how does the patient and society ultimately benefit? Uh, we don't use this term in the United States too much, but in Europe and Australia, the quality adjusted life year, the health gain, uh, higher taxes and greater societal productivity, that's the currency. Uh, this is the Johns Hopkins model, but is, but is similar in many universities. Uh, the, the exact math may vary by a few percentage points as you go around the country, but that is a typical uh, allocation of uh, royalties earned, usually half to the inventor, half to the school, and, and some subdivision. But I think it's quite interesting to let's just take one university as a model. Let's look at MIT. Here's one university that they've founded 4,000 companies. Every year they generate 230 billion. That one university is the 23rd largest economy in the world for economic productivity. What if more universities could work in the MIT model? It's a very competitive environment. The Chinese, the uh, British, the Germans have all taken great interest and their governments are making big investments. So what's the pathway? How should these ideas that come out of uh, great universities like West Virginia University get to the market? Today about 92% go to market through licensing and 7 or 8% through startups, new enterprises. Our company only engages in licensing. We do not take partnerships in startups. However, contrary to the model of Cook Medical, my employer, what we really need today to feed this ecosystem are exciting, young, vibrant companies built on the ideas of people like yourselves that will feed an ecosystem that eventually allows the larger players up to the Johnson & Johnson's, Medtronic's, Pfizer, to acquire those companies, incorporate those into larger portfolios, leverage them to even greater utility. The startup is such a vital part of that uh, chain, that, that ecosystem, and today these large companies have very few candidates to acquire. There's a paucity of startups being formed and their five-year survival rate today is not high enough. So there is work to do on both sides, I would say, together to not only get these ideas um, formed, incorporated, but to get more support to them so at the five and ten-year intervals they're succeeding. So well, one of the things that I think our industry has learned is that Investing in a diagnosis, investing in a broad problem rarely yields important improvements. Where we normally see the health gain is investing in a potential solution to the problem, and oftentimes it fails. 
people will often say, why don't you fund our lab? We want to do some research on cancer or diabetes or heart disease. And if you'll give us some funding, we think we can make significant improvement. Usually doesn't work. However, when someone says, I've been facing this problem for several years, and I think I might have something that could help us make a, a gain, would you provide some support so that we could conduct some trials, so we could build some prototypes, and then we can quickly validate or invalidate that approach. Sometimes we refine it. Many of these, again, eventually fail, but this is the process that uh, we found to be much more successful. The germ for these great ideas, the angioplasty balloon, the coronary stent, the dialysis machine, even the stethoscope, usually originates in the mind of an overworked clinician who is solving a really important problem. It's sort of the patient's problem, it's sort of the hospital's problem, it's sort of the insurance industry's problem, but more than anything, it's their problem. They either perceive this problem to be something that's unsafe for the patient, it's inconvenient, it's a, a distraction, there's something about this that says, I love the operation, but this one part drives me crazy. I've got to solve this. And when they do, they're usually solving a problem that other people face at the same time. Once they've identified the problem that they face, that they uniquely face, or at least individually face, they can share that idea with a sponsor, with a, someone that has the ability to build these prototypes, and then you quickly together find out whether you're barking up the right tree. So, what, what can be done? I don't want to talk about FDA, about reimbursement, things that we, uh, those of us in the room today are probably not going to influence. There's so many factors that contribute to success or failure in translation research, in academic industry partnerships, but I think if we'll stick to those things that we're capable of influencing, then I think we have a much better chance of, of uh, seeing uh, progress. The first I would say is if someone in the room today happens to have an idea that reaches the market, I hope that the university would back that person and say, we will bring it on board so you can use it in your own patients. We will make it available to you to improve the quality of care you provide. I think it's terrific that students today are introduced to the potential risks of conflicts. It's, a, it's an important conversation, but by limiting it only to that, I think it sells the whole idea short. If the university isn't also teaching about how can these relationships be productive, be transparent, uh, be in the best interest of the patient, it, if you don't talk about how can companies help with research, education, today uh, industry pays about 65% of all the biomedical research in the United States, we used to be about half of the CME, that's down to about 37% and falling like a rock. What kind of education could the university be providing on how to innovate, how to file for a patent, uh, how to work with a company? And I, I just think that's a great opportunity that has largely been overlooked. Uh, I, I won't dwell on these, but um, one thing I think would be a great idea there are 5,500 manufacturers licensed through the FDA. These are companies that uh, have products in the market today. And we tend to think about industry as being industry. But, but my suggestion is that you really have 5,500 companies with incredibly unique cultures, processes, value systems. And rather than judge them as industry just because someone walked in the front door carrying a briefcase, wouldn't it be great if you could assign a value to each of these individuals and their companies and then select for those that do the best job for you? And if they're not honest, if they're not timely, if they don't bring value, then in a very Darwinian sense, they should be selected against. But if they do help you do your jobs better, if they bring good information, if they help you provide better care to patients, then maybe those are the companies who should be supported, whose access should be expanded, and I'm, I'm not sure today that there's very many places that have assigned a value system to their suppliers, to their partners, in a way that helps the university achieve 
its goals and, and for the companies as well. One of the real challenges is that how do you be different? How do you succeed in an environment that is increasingly conformist? It's, it's pretty hard to break out today because if you do, you tend to get slapped. But I think that every school, including the land grants, do have opportunities, however narrow, to stake a position that in one small way or another deviates from what is generally considered to be a standard. Not all of these experiments are going to be successful, and you can always retrench if they don't work. But an introspective exercise that allows you to say, what are we really good at? What could we be doing? And then giving a six-month or one-year trial period. This, to me, is the, uh, perhaps the easiest way forward to make a phenomenal university that you work at today even better in the future. I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be uh, happy to try to address those. Uh, again, I'm very, very pleased to be here with you today. I, I hold your university in very high esteem, and I say it on behalf of our company, and thank you very much. If anyone has any, any questions. Yes, Val. I was wondering software. Software? Uh, software today is being regulated by FDA uh, for what that's worth. I'm not an expert with software. I, I can't advise you specifically, but there are experts, and I would encourage you to both on campus and off campus, try to identify people that relate to the software innovation that you're imagining, whether it's related to protecting your idea through intellectual property, uh, commercialization strategies, how to de-risk your uh, software, uh, and finding a place for it in the market where it can really help people. And your tech transfer office can probably be a valuable ally to you in that effort. Uh, there's uh, online um, uh, support and consultative stuff. Um, give Richard your contact and I'll think about it. And if I can think of some, some partners, some potential partners for you, I'll pass that along. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Uh, research devices. Uh, well, there's high interest today. Uh, you may be familiar with the Beckman Coulter Corporation, on, now owned by Danaher, uh, Fisher Scientific, which is now part of uh, Thermo, uh, Thermo Fisher Corporation. There are several large multinationals and a whole catalog of intermediate and small companies whose whole business strategy are developing technologies to facilitate research. These are uh, quantitative technologies, uh, you know, everything from HPLC equipment on. So, yeah, there's a whole vibrant industry around technologies that can be sold to laboratories to help foster uh, basic and clinical research. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Most of the work that our company engages are technologies that uh, impact the clinical uh, side of the hospital. But the, I would suggest that the, uh, the industry for non-clinical is as vibrant, uh, maybe not quite as visible in some cases, but their trade organizations and their trade shows are packed. And there's all kinds of exciting work going on with uh, whether it's uh, um, the human genome, all, all kinds of things. Yes, sir. Well, there are several ways you can do it. I would begin, you know, working through the, the university and through your uh, technology management uh, department, your OTL, your, your licensing office, 
and then identifying those companies that really share your vision for the technology and finding these, uh, whether it's venture capitalists or angels or established manufacturers, you'll probably have some idea about what role you'd like to play. Some people want to be very hands-off. Other people would like to, to have responsibility within this new organization. And so if uh, the university could probably help you identify companies that are already in the space that you're developing in, and they can sign non-disclosure agreements and say, we have a technology, would you like to take a look at it? Um, the VCs are the same way they tend to aggregate around certain platforms and invite them to come to campus and say, geez, we'd like to put this in front of you. If you're interested, we'd like to have a, a conversation. Uh, but I think getting together culturally, what are the goals, what's, what are the realistic expectations, how are we going to divide up the responsibility and the credit? And once you meet someone that sees this very much the way you do, you know it very quickly and the magic happens from there. But it's not an easy process because uh, startups are very risky today in healthcare. We see a lot of it in, in uh, semiconductors because they have much less regulation. But there are resources out there, and again, we do not have an abundance of startups for the larger companies to acquire, so there's lots of funding, and again, um, you know, we can talk offline a little more specifically if you'd like, but, but I think there are avenues uh, available for, for the situation you're describing. Yes, ma'am. So that's not only common, but it's really the most common. In fact, industry today is criticized uh, mercilessly for doing incremental improvement. These are the variations. Say, why don't you do the big grand slam? Why are you just doing incremental improvement? Probably because that's the way the incentive structures work, but also because that's the way human thought works, uh, evolutionary improvement more often than revolutionary. So virtually all the device companies, and it could be argued perhaps even in drugs as well, that most of the development is incremental and, and uh, along a certain line. And many of the ideas that eventually become mainstream start as extremely niche products. And people say, gosh, who's interested? What, what size of population are you, gonna, are, you, are you gonna help with this? And yet, once something turns out to be successful, it's amazing how quickly and how broadly that core technology may expand into much broader indications and applications. So, I hope people don't get discouraged about what appears to be a very narrow either subset of patients that serve as the population or the platform looks to be a, on a very small kind of technology. Help five people and let the rest take care of itself. But those five people will always be grateful to you and you'll be amazed that maybe it's 10 and then it's 20 and then it's 100. You know, we're facing a real problem today by keeping startups afloat. The timelines have gone so long. See, most of the venture capital corporations have a defined payout period. They have to reward their investors at eight years, sometimes seven. And that has historically been the maximum time that you can hold those funds before you return it to the investor. Well, today, our FDA trials may last three or four years, just the, just the research side. And then when we have production and distribution, and uh, then you have the, uh, I mean, the timelines today have become greatly extended. And this puts startups under great stress. Uh, but I do think there are several things that, you know, they're so rare today, and the valuations have become phenomenal. Uh, for the acquisitions. They're multiples of uh, potential income. Most of these companies, when they're sold today, haven't even earned their first dollar in sales. It's the opportunity to earn in the future that attracts the investment, and the multiples on that opportunity are as high as I've ever seen them. So if you can convince a potential acquirer, look what this could potentially do for this number of patients, all kinds of communities, the commercial community, the financial communities, the 
There are uh, fast tracks now at FDA. Uh, there's an initiative you might want to check out called 21st Century Cures, uh, a bipartisan piece of legislation in the Congress that's pushing for to reduce this, this uh, chasm that you're describing, this uh, uh, valley of death, they call it. So nobody wants to take the risk because uh, it's, it takes, you know, time is, is resource. And as these things go out to the uh, age of old scotches today, 20 years and 15 years and this sort of stuff, say, gosh, you know, what are we going to tie up these funds for 15 years? I put in a CD and do better. And this capital seeks its highest utility. And some people say, they, geez, the highest utility is in a chip or in a smartphone app, not in a drug or device or diagnostic that really helps a patient. But the industry, and I say that broadly, really is desperate for the ideas, these startup ideas that could come out of places like WVU. If you get with the right folks, it's going to happen. It's, it's generally, I would say, multifactorial, and that's a problem that every university faces today. However, in my experience, you can solve the majority of this along two or three lines. One is your policies. When your policies say we want innovation, and yet once you go to enact the policy, they do everything against innovation. And I say that with respect and, and, and trying to be polite. But many times innovators find more hurdles internally than they find externally. They find a university culture that devalues their effort, doesn't reward progress, uh, inhibits interaction or, or uh, partnership. Many, many of the really creative people on campuses, they become pariahs. They're, they're, they're not invited to, the, to lunch anymore. There's a lot of envy. Um, I, I think you have to really Ask your employer, are you really with me on this? Are you behind me in deed or only in word? And that's a very difficult conversation because the university today takes on risk by, by backing its, its innovators. But the places that have done it successfully said it's happily a risk we'll take because in the overall scheme of things, we're really achieving our mission and the highest level by doing so. And even though we have to accept certain criticisms on occasion, the end result is so valuable, our shoulders are big enough to do it. But I think you have to start with policy and a culture. It usually helps to have a couple of success stories to build that culture around. And once you have a couple of models to say, well, you know, it didn't work out so bad for these people, and maybe we could emulate that in a few other laboratories or a few other departments. And then you have to concentrate your resources. You can either in life be an inch wide and a mile deep or a mile wide and an inch deep. And you sort of have to find, you know, do we give $15 to everybody or do we really pool those funds to the most important, most promising ideas and really make a significant investment? And I don't think you can do all one or the other, and I'm not suggesting that you go all in on one idea. But, but I think um, without some focus, these things tend to float around and, and don't, uh, don't get the commitment they need. But if, if you, um, I've been on the campuses of universities where there's enough of this that has succeeded. They look at one another as colleagues and saying, why don't we try that? Let's do it. They don't all work out. There's still a lot of failures at Stanford, still a lot of failures at UCLA but they're always trying to do better. And they've really moved past this idea of, gosh, you know, is it really proper to have the sales rep in talking to the, you know, they say, look, that's, that's not what we're interested in. Let's focus on those things that are gonna move this forward. So I would say policy and culture are the very best places to start. And once you master those issues, the other things are usually pretty manageable. Yes, sir. I think that cultures change when they feel like they need to change, when everything else has failed and they don't have any choice but to change. Because all of us and our human nature is uh, behavior responds to incentive. 
and behavior also responds to disincentive. Once you're rewarded for behaving in a certain way, practicing in a certain way, uh, uh, working in a certain way, then changing the way that you do that. I'm the classic example. I, I don't buy a new car because I can't stand learning the new controls on the dashboard. It drives me crazy. I'm hitting the radio when I think I was getting the, the temperature control. And so I put off embracing really what are really improvements. Now my new thing, it actually has a GPS. I can plot my, my trip on a map that's on my dashboard. I haven't figured out how to use it. Um, I think that what drives this change is usually when nothing else has worked and you've tried everything else you can think of. And when I look around at land-grant universities today, very good universities that see their NIH funding in decline, National Science Foundation funding is not what it once was, people want their lives to be meaningful. And you don't want to be part of an organization or an institution that is stuck in neutral. You want to be part of something that's moving forward, something you could feel very proud about. And this idea of affiliation is, is quite a strong instinct. Organizations, you know, even big schools like this, they're always fragile. And if they fail to take what look like bold steps, but really when they get around to it, it's not that big a deal. But when they say, you know, we're going to change our policy a little bit. We're going to step out. And what works at Hopkins may not be exactly what works for us. We actually operate in sort of different models. We have different payers. We have different cases, case uh, mixes. And we want to respond to our state, our students, our patients in an appropriate way that may not agree in its entirety with that of a peer institution. And if you allow yourselves to try some experience, I mean some experiments, uh, carefully thought out and, and not be reckless about it, but you can't spend all your time just trying to design it. At some point you have to jump on the horse and start riding. I don't, I don't know if this is the right answer to your question, but where people have, U University of California, Irvine is a great example. They used to be the, the dud of the UC universe. They had nothing going on. And today they actually have a really a lot of exciting things happening. And I think they did it because they said, what do we have to lose? I mean, you know, we're, we have to compete with UC San Francisco. Their CTSA on renewal was $112 million, the largest in the United States competing with UCLA, whose uh, clinical revenue is uh, roughly that of all of the rest combined, except for UCSF, we've got to do something different. And, and today, they're really smoking. Thank you.